Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're enjoying your lunch. A little preview of Thanksgiving. Uh, my name is Carol Bolton, and I work here at the History Center as part of the Learning Services team. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. We always love having you with us, and I hope you'll be able to join us next month as well. Uh, but I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Tressa Brown, uh, who serves, uh, who coordinates the work of the Kentucky Native, Ameri Native American Heritage Commission. Um, they are uh, right next door, so we get to have Tressa as a neighbor, uh, which is fun. And just to tell you a little bit about her work, uh, the Native Ameri American Heritage Commission uh, was founded in 1996, and it is a 17-member body that works to educate uh, Kentuckians about the history of uh, Native American people here in the Commonwealth, um, as well as about the very important cultural contributions uh, that they've made to our state. And uh, they also promote the conservation and preservation of Native American artifacts and culture. And uh, as we'll be learning about today, they also work to promote uh, accurate depiction of Native Americans as well. Uh, to those ends, Tressa and the Commission have produced some excellent educational materials uh, for teachers to use in the classroom. They've also been very helpful uh, for me as well in planning programming here uh, at the History Center. And uh, they also sponsor and participate in cultural events around the state, one of which you might be familiar with, the Living Archaeology Weekend, which happens every September uh, at Red River Gorge. If you've been uh, in the past, you might have seen Tressa there because she demonstrates um, hide tanning, which is so cool. She knows how to do that. Um, I've already hit her up to come over here, so uh, hopefully we can make that happen soon. Um, but uh, she has some wonderful things to share with us. I've had the chance to hear her uh, share before and uh, immediately wanted to uh, have her come and, and share with us here at the History Center. Uh, so if you will, please welcome Tressa Brown. Thank you. Is it good? Are we good? We're we good? All right. I'm not used to doing like big formal things like this, so you'll have to, I tend to move around a lot, which will keep you all awake after a wonderful meal like that. <clears throat> I don't know if it'll keep me awake, but it needs to keep you all awake. All right. <clears throat> My name is Tressa Brown. Um, I'm a Kentuckian. We were talking about who's a Kentuckian. I'm a Kentuckian from uh, Boyle County. I live in Mercer County now. Went to Transylvania University and then to Arizona State. I work for the Kentucky uh, Heritage Council, which is not the Historical Society. And uh, I work with two groups of people on a daily basis. One are the Native Americans or American Indians of the state, and the other is African American because I also coordinate the African American Heritage Commission. And frequently the, the work that I do, um, it interrelates. It inter there's intersections to these two groups of people a lot. But today, uh, this is American Indian Heritage Month, November is. So we're going to focus specifically on Kentucky's history. And <clears throat> it's a very deep history. There are myths about the history. There are misconceptions about the history. And there, those myths and misconceptions have created problems that we deal with today. Every day, I have to kind of um, basically set set the record straight, as it were. So here we go. We got 12,000 years of history to get through before you all go to sleep, right? So we're good. All right, this is the first myth. The first myth is that no Native people actually lived in Kentucky. And if I had a big red buzzer, I'd be hitting it now long and hard, okay? Um, Native people have been in Kentucky, like I said, for nearly 12,000 years. We know this through archaeological work, okay? We know this. Next one. So this is a really quick, uh, I'm not really going to give you time to read all of this unless you're really speed readers, but we're looking at the, the primary timeline for American Indian peoples in the state. And so if you think about when the first, when folks first came in, 
These were hunters and gatherers that came in. They were following a lot of the big megafauna, uh, the big mastodons and those, those guys. I mean, can you imagine somebody running out there, the men running out there to hunt these big animals that were 12 feet tall, and they have a stick and rock, you know, and they did it really well because they ended up being our ancestors. So all the way through, uh, <clears throat> The, there were some major turning points, uh, the change from hunter hunting and gathering to hunting, gathering and gardening was a big turning point. And then another one was when people started agriculture, so they had big, instead of just little gardens, they had big fields. And then of course when the white folks showed up that changed the game completely. Um, and uh, one of the things you'll notice at 8700, a lot of people think that the bow and arrow has been used for a long time, not so long. The atlatl, which is a spear thrower, has been used uh, around the world longer than any other weapon in existence. So all it is is a stick, and sometimes it has a rock on it, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and the, the reason I say that is when, when you think about these people's lives and, and what they, what resources they had. They had rocks and sticks, and they had bone and antler. And everything that they had came from those things. They had no metal, okay? So uh, no metal for tools. Copper was mm, ishy, uh, and they traded that in. Next one. So when we're talking about the prehistoric, the prehistoric peoples, we're gonna go back from the hunters and gatherers in the next one, when they first come in in the next one. Like I said, hunter-gatherers, uh, and they were small groups of people, like small family bands that came in and moved uh, down past where the glacier was and then further down in Kentucky. Uh, and then they started growing gardens. Now the gardening is a key piece, okay, because that really changes how people live because they, they move from having um, small groups of people that can easily change locations to follow uh, either nuts and, and berries and that kind kind of thing, or the animals, to places where they're going to stay for an extended period of time because they've put in a garden. Now there is not a county in this state that does not have evidence of Native American presence. Not a county of the 120, okay? In every county there are archaeological remains of uh, Native presence, okay? Next one. These are the big chunks of time that we deal with. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a cultural anthropologist. I deal often with archaeologists. They deal with the dead folks. I deal with the live ones, which is the easy way to remember it. Um, so um, we're talking about the paleo indian period through the archaic, through into the archaic period. That's the hunter-gatherer. Then they started gardening and then they started agriculture into the uh, woodland period. Okay, so these are just the big chunks of time. <clears throat> Next one. Now the Paleo Indian period, they were basically eating uh, a lot of meat, okay? That was a huge portion of their diet. Uh, they were hunting um, and then their, their existence was uh, big animals, like the big megafauna, like mammoths and mastodons and whatever uh, roots and berries and things that they were gathering along the way. And at this time too, uh, the, the area that they were coming through looked very much like Canada does now. Lots of evergreens, the whole, uh, the, the environment was very different than what we see today. Next one. Uh, the archaic period starts when they start gardening. So uh, you'll notice that they have uh, a, a variety of things going on here. They're still hunting, still gathering, but they're starting the gardening process. And uh, I'll get more into that in a minute. Next one. If anybody has seen this poster, everything on this poster is, is drawn from a real object, from a real artifact, okay? If you'll notice, it diverges down here in the Paleo period. Mm -hmm. It has different scenes of people doing different activities. There's projectile points, they are not arrowheads. They're not arrowheads until when? 17, 700, right? Because they didn't have arrows before that. Uh, everything before that was a spear. So uh, <clears throat> if it has a base on it, essentially if it has, if it looks like a Christmas tree with a, with a trunk, then it's a spear point. If it doesn't have a trunk, 
it's an arrowhead. That's a quick and dirty way to, to remember it. So most of what people find are actually spear points. They're older. Um, but, but one of the things that this poster also does is it separates the state in half from about the falls of the Ohio from Louisville area straight down. You have the western portion and the eastern portion. The western portion turned into the Mississippian culture and the eastern portion turned into what we call the Fort Ancient culture. Their cultures were a couple hundred, deer, a couple hundred years um, separate. Like the folks in, I could make a joke to say the folks in the East are always a little bit behind the times. But in, in, in fact, culturally speaking, for this time frame, they were a little bit just off. Okay, So things were happening in the West a, a couple hundred years before they were happening in the East. And so when you look at the, um, the divergent path of these sets of artifacts, that's for the Fort Ancient period or for the uh, Mississippian period. Okay? You'll notice also when uh, you start having gardening about the middle where the sunflower is, you also notice that they start creating ceramic pots then too. Pottery is a huge thing across the state, and you're not going to create big pots if you have to carry them around too much. So you're going to do that when you start um, having more sedentary areas. Next one. This is another big thing. It's like, oh, there had to be somebody come in from outside, you know, aliens or something, to build the mounds. No, they were the people that were here. The people that were here built the mounds, and their ancestors are the ones that Daniel Boone ran out, okay? Um, I get a little flippant about things, and you'll have to excuse me, um, or not. Because, uh, because there's so many myths about who was here when early settlers came in, to me it's just like, no, oh, that's, that's junk. But it's still in so there's it's still in print it's still in uh, discussions that oh yeah when they came in there weren't there wasn't anybody living here no that's not true there were people living here the entire time okay now there were some times when the population thinned out and we'll get to that so uh so the the ancestors of the native people of the shawnee and the cherokee and the uchi and the Chip, uh, chickasaw from the west that's the ones that built the mounds, okay? Those are the people, the Kentucky people. Next one. You get into the Woodland period, and that's the period that we know best from um, what um, popular stories tell us. Uh, it's the period that um, the, the Daniel Boone TV show, that's the Woodland period, okay? That's what, when people were uh, living in small houses and they were using bows and arrows, and that's quote where the, the stereotype kind of gets put in is during this period, right? Next one. When you get, and go back one, go back one. Yeah, if you can. Yeah. So you have images like this that we know are accurate. Or they're, a, they're fairly accurate to what people were wearing, and they're very accurate to what people were doing and how they were living. And this is the, the picture that most people have in their head of early Native American life in the state, or anywhere for that matter. Uh, the, the key here is that it doesn't show a couple of things. It doesn't show any of the trade goods that were coming in at this time and hundreds of years before this. The trade routes through Kentucky were extensive, okay? And we know this archeologically because we find the stuff. We find obsidian that doesn't occur naturally in Kentucky. We find turquoise that doesn't occur naturally in Kentucky. We find um, Pacific and Atlantic shell, seashells. Doesn't occur naturally in Kentucky. We find feathers and shells from Mexico. Doesn't occur in Kentucky. And they were all coming in here through trade routes. So there were extensive trade routes, native trade routes, that were bringing things into Kentucky and taking things out. Um, and images like this don't show you that. Okay, next one. This does show you that. These people were cosmopolitan for the time, all right? This is a mural that's at Wycliffe Mounds that is based on um, the Mississippian culture in that entire region, not just in Kentucky, but in that entire region. Huge, extensive trade routes. These folks were artists. They had 
gorgeous ceramics that they made. Uh, you'll notice that they have feather capes. Uh, they do have hide clothing, but both in the east and west they had um, fabric that was woven prehistoric fabric, okay? We're talking not fabric that's all one color. We're talking plaids, folks. Very elaborate, um, very um, detailed types of woven fabric. And we know this, it's been found in the rock shelters in Red River Gorge. So we know this. And we, there's too much of it and the accoutrements to make it so that we know that material was not just traded in. Uh, so these images give you a little bit better picture of, of the, the social life and the ties that these people had before European influence, okay? Uh, these, these folks were the traders, okay? They were right on the Mississippi River, so they had traffic going up and down the Mississippi as well as traffic going across the, straight, the state. And this, like I said, these folks in the west were a little, you know, a couple hundred years ahead of the folks in the east, but it was happening in the east as well. Next one. Extensive, elaborate uh, ceremonial systems as well. These were systems where the religion and the, um, the leadership of, of the towns were connected. <clears throat> and these were large towns. There, it wasn't a little village. It wasn't like, you know, when Daniel Boone comes in and it's like two houses or something. No, there were hundreds of people living in these, in these towns. And it wasn't just in Western Kentucky, it was in Eastern Kentucky as well. Uh, extensive, and in fact, there was a, a town outside of um, Lexington that was supposed to be like very cosmopolitan, having all kinds of native people there as well as Europeans later on. So, you know, you see the extent, a lot of these towns were palisaded, they had a, a, um, a fence around the outside of the village with the, with the agricultural farms on the outside, and then they had um, regular folk living on the inside, and the higher up you lived on a mound, the more important you were. You know, I'd probably be way down there in the, somewhere, and you know, Scott and his folks would be up here somewhere. Um, but, and the, the ceremonial uh, system that was in place also drew a lot of people in on, on, uh, on occasion because they were the, that's where they got their population to build these mounds, okay? So there were mound building people on east and west. And in the, in the western tip of Kentucky where the Chickasaw claim that land, nobody, even today, nobody argues with the fact that's Chickasaw land. Okay, from about Bowling Green West, all that's Chickasaw, and nobody today even, say, even says, oh no, that's ours, and no, that doesn't happen. Now, the rest of the state, Shawnee were here first. Shawnee were the first historic tribe that we know that was here. The Uchi had a big chunk of it, and then the Cherokee came in, and basically there was some warfare, there were some um, uh, different epidemics that came through that kind of thinned out the native population in Kentucky, and then uh, the Shawnee ended up on the other side of the Ohio into their winter and then uh, the Cherokee kind of uh, became the Kentucky uh, native people. Next one. <clears throat> we talked about uh, that gardening um, that gardening history and what these people were gardening in the beginning uh, about the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. Well, there's an older, older sister and then the sister and then there's the youngest sister, okay? Uh, the oldest, oldest sister is Squash and she's a few hundred years older than the Bean sister. And then she's a few hundred years older than the youngest, which is the Corn sister. So there was a couple hundred years in between these three elements coming together for that three sisters garden. What's impressive though is that there are um, six places around the world where we know gardening started. And that's a key thing. It's a world hearth of plant domestication. There's one in uh, the Middle East, there's one in China, there's one in uh, Africa, there's one in South America, there's one in Mexico, and there's one in Red River Gorge, Kentucky. Okay? There's six places around the world, we have one of them. And here we know they started domesticating sunflower seeds, what we still eat, 
cool, you know. Now, some of the other stuff that they were domesticating, like goosefoot and maygrass and some other stuff, we don't eat anymore. Although what's what's happening is people are coming back to those old ancient grains like um, quinoa, which hit the market big time now. Uh, all of that's coming back because it's very healthy. And that's what these folks were growing before corn came in. And then corn kind of pushed that out because it's a whole lot bigger and easier to process than little tiny seeds that are about mustard seed size. So when we're talking about world plant, uh, world hearth of plant domestication, Kentucky has a spot, okay? Uh, next one. <clears throat> now, shifting gears, we have this very deep, deep history. We have, and, it, and it's broad, okay? We have a lot of connections to a lot of different people uh, coming in and through Kentucky. A lot of native people claimed Kentucky, even the Mohawk way up in, the, in um, you know, New York and all the way up into Canada claimed Kentucky. They didn't live here. They just said, oh yeah, that's, that's part of us. Of course they would, you know, who wouldn't want it? Um, and there's other, other tribes that have come through. Uh, we hear of, um, Potawatomi people coming through and Winnebago people coming through and historic documents, we see a number of tribes that are represented. They did not come from here, okay? The Shawnee, the Yuchi, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, those are the ones that came from here. There are some smaller groups of people, the Tupelo and the Saponi that were in this area too in Kentucky. They are not, um, not well represented in, in the history. What we have now, okay, so what would I say? Chickasaw, Shawnee, uh, Cherokee, Yuchi, four major tribes, basically three major and a smaller one. Uh, four that claim Kentucky, that, that people are very comfortable saying those are Kentucky tribes. <clears throat> According to the 2010 census, we have 198 tribes represented in the state today. 198, folks. Now you talk about a native population, you got it. And it's mixed in among everybody else. And so when we talk about when the commission deals with Kentucky's uh, Native American heritage, we deal with that 10,000 years worth of history, okay, all the way up until 2010 told us that we have 194 other tribes we need to be dealing with. We need to be educating about and for. And one of the things that all of those people deal with are stereotypes. So we're talking about uh, images, language, behavior, uh, just concepts that all Native people deal with. And we have become very sensitized to um, racist comments or derogatory language or behavior for many other groups of people, we are not sensitized yet to that for the Native American populations. Now you'll hear me use American Indian and Native American and Indigenous and First Peoples, okay? Because different groups of people use different terms. I think the, uh, um, the U.S. government uses the term American Indian almost exclusively in its policy, for better or worse, their policies. But I want to get to this a little bit because I think this is really, really important with dealing with understanding the history of Kentucky and then coming and bringing it up to uh, today. Today's, you know, two minutes ago is history, right? So we got to deal with this. Next one. This is what you get a lot. And, and it is, you, you have these images in your head. Everybody does. You can't deny the fact that from the time that you can remember all the way up until today, you have different images that speak to you about who another group of people is. For American Indians, it comes from a number of different sources, okay? And all of these inform the basic stereotype for American Indians. Next one. Which are these four things. You have the Disney version. Okay, you have the savage, you have the man of nature, and then you have the caricature. These are basically the four, um, the four problematic areas. Next one. Now, these, these come from a historic kind of events. 
And these are the events that the basic uh, stereotype of American Indians come from. The basic stereotype, okay, if I say American Indian, what pops into your brain? What's the one thing that pops into your brain right now? Give me one. Feathers. Feathers. What's another one? Bow and arrow. Bow and arrow. Another one. Teepees. What's another one? Tomahawk. Tomahawk. What's another one? Ooh. Yeah. What's another one? Black hair. Pardon? Black hair. Black hair. What's another one? That's okay. What's another one? Redskin. Yes. And another one. Thanks for bringing that up. We'll get to that later. <laughs> Paint. Okay. And um, all of that is true in a microcosm. Next one. Okay, Carl Bodmer was a German landscape artist who was hired by Prince Maximilian to come and document a trip in the, in the 1830s, going to the plains, checking out the vanishing American. Yeah, we're still here. Um, but Carl Bodmer's <coughs> paintings are exquisite exquisitely detailed. He took three or four days to do one painting. The tribes that he, uh, that he painted actually used his paintings to check out how people were dressed, the detail of, of certain cultural aspects. They look at those paintings for that, okay, because they're very accurate. Um, next one. That's also a Bodmer. Next one. That's uh, Catlin. Catlin did the same thing during the same time period. He was an American self-taught artist. Uh, he did three or four paintings in a day. His were sketchier, but they were still very accurate with what he was representing, with, with the peoples he went through, the Mandan and the Hidatsa and some of the um, Plains tribes. Listen to me, Plains tribes, okay? West of the Mississippi River, onto the Plains, and some of them did live in teepees, some of them did not. The Mandan and Hidatsa did not live in teepees. Um, but this is the image that uh, Bodmer and Catlin brought back to the East Coast, and then they did artistic tours, and they took them to Germany, they took them to Great Britain. So this, this, these sets of paintings traveled extensively. They made copies of them, so they were published extensively. So what did people see worldwide? These images for American Indians. This is where the beginning of the stereotype comes from, is these images, because they were followed up by two, thing, two, two things. Uh, next one. They were followed up by illustrations um, and uh, lecture series. Now, the illustrations were in Penny Dreadful novels, which always put American Indians as the savage, um, you know, perpetrator of all kinds of bad things. Like the guy lurking behind the door, getting ready to get the white woman, always, you know? And, uh, and how he got in the house, and she's on the inside, and he's on the inside, it doesn't make any sense to me. But this is, this is the way that they were uh, portrayed in Penny Dreadful novels all the way up until about the 1920, 1924, 1924, okay, and past. We'll get to that also. Um, the other thing is that the, uh, in the 1860s, the Plains Wars were happening, and so a lot of U.S. cavalry officers and soldiers went out west to try to deal with that problem. When they were finished with their tour of duty, they came back east. And what did they do? They went on a lecture circuit because they're going to talk about what they did, okay? There were the, the officers themselves, and then, then there were officers' wives. And they went on the lecture, both of them went on lecture circuits because typically, even though women may have gone to listen to the men, Rarely did the men go and listen to the women speaking. So it was two groups of people. But what they talked about was their experience, and their experience was with these kind of, oh my gosh, you know, you're gonna have to make your lecture sound sexy for you to fill the rooms, get the money in the plate, folks. And that's what they did. They said, oh, you know, I was scared all the time. I thought I was gonna be scalped, and they were dirty and rotten, and you know, all. that is what, that kind of language and those kind of stories that backed up the images that Bodmer and Catlin had painted. Because people had those images, and then they had these images, and then they had that storyline laid on top, okay? That's two parts of it. Next one. <coughs> then you had Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West Show as one example. There were many of these. And uh, he took it on the road, and he gave the whole thing life. 
in a huge way. He was like the epitome of the entertainer. Okay, so he had the images because Bodmer and Catlin painted from life. They had those real folks there, standing there in front of them. These Wild West shows had real, real Indians, and they advertised real Indians. And they came with their own stuff. They came with their own uh, costumes, okay, their own regalia. So what they were wearing was accurate for them, for Plains people. And they reenacted, just like they did in the Colosseum in Rome, they reenacted battles and stuff. They reenacted, here comes the stagecoach, and here comes the Indians following the stagecoach, and they attack the stagecoach, and then here comes the cavalry over the hill and kills all the Indians, and woohoo, we're good, you know? Or there's the cabin in the middle of the, of the arena, and here come the Indians going around and around. Of course, you know, it was a round arena, so they couldn't go anywhere else. Um, and then here comes the cavalry in, and they kill all the Indians and save, you know, save the people. And it, they did that. And they went to different places. And guess where they went? They went to Great Britain, and they went to Germany. Same places, following the same route that Catlin and Bodmer's paintings did. So you're building, you have images, and then you have the language, and then you have it all put together in a wonderful package that shows Native people as being the aggressors all the time. And they're all using the same Plains people. Now, everything that Carl Bodmer and Catlin painted was accurate for the Mandan people, or accurate for the Hidatsa people, or accurate for whoever those folks were out there, but only for them. Not for anybody else, but everybody else said, oh, that's an American Indian. They're very identifiable, but if you don't have feathers and paint and, and um, you know, fringe and everything, then you're not an Indian, which left those Mohawk people out in the cold, okay? Because they have velvet. All right? Next. Okay, and, and it continued through, like I said, the 1930s and 40s still had these kind of images, and we still get images in children's books uh, that are, are the, uh, the savage Indian stereotype, still. Uh, this, one's, this one's in the 19, uh, no, this one's an early one. Next one. I'm going to go through these again. Now, Buffalo Bill was not the only one, but, you know, um, and actually Sitting Bull, if you're familiar with, with him, he was actually in Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show for a while. Real, real dude, you know? Next one. But these are the images that kids saw for, you know, for decades. This is what they were seeing. Next one. So how can you, um, how can you expect the general population to have any other image than that of a savage, you know, warrior coming at you and thinking you're going to get scalped if you meet one, okay? And the whole thing about the vanishing ending is like, oh, well, there aren't any more of them, are there? And that's what, I mean, I have been in school rooms, especially about 10 years ago, up until about mm, five years ago, oh, there, are there any Indians left? That's what people ask me. It's like, well, yeah, hi. Uh, next one. Okay, and this continues through all of the new media. It continues through TV shows. I mean, pick one, like I've been talking about Daniel Boone. And it comes all the way up into contemporary, it probably until about Dan movie, they started kind of sort of getting things better. But then even in Dances with Wolves and even in, uh, what's it, um, um, yeah, that was before. That one. Uh, you still have all the Huron guys are bad, and all these guys are good. All those guys are savages, and all these guys are the noble red man. You know, and you had that in Dances with Wolves. You still have that. You don't have, like, these are people, human beings, okay? And some of them are good, and some of them are bad, and some of them are both, and some of them are neither. But what really bothers me most is when you get school activities and you get educational material that, that supports these stereotypes. Thanksgiving, okay, I was the mom from I have to say, um, started going to school, and my son comes home, Mom, we're going to do a Thanksgiving thing. Cool, what are you going to do? We're going to do Indians and Pilgrims. And I'm going, no, you're not. No, you're not. And until I, I was speaking to the teachers, and I said, Martin Luther King Day, Black History Month, did you b b dress your kids up like black kids? Like African-American uh, enslaved people? Oh, no. You don't have a problem dressing your kids up like Indians, though, do you? And until you pull it pointedly, people don't get it. 
You have to put it side by side to really shift your brain around to think, oh, I really need to think about what I'm saying and where it's all coming from, and this is where it all comes from. Next one. These were typical illustrations for alphabet books in probably the 1950s. Okay? Next one. These are typical, the top one is a typical illustration out of a textbook up into the 70s. You almost never get just your regular family scene, okay? And if you get a family scene, it's almost always the Indian princess or the old hag. There's no in-between for the women, okay? There's no in-between. Next. This is the 1970s up into the 80s. Next one. Same thing. Next one. Oh, okay. okay. So, American, American Indian have served in every conflict from before the beginning of this country. Okay? Everyone. World War I, before they were citizens. They were not citizens in 1924. They weren't citizens. Who the heck said, hi, Columbus, how are you? They're not citizens until 24. They were, work, they were serving in World War I before they were citizens. Serving gave them citizenship, okay? This was World War II. This is after World War II. This would have been a box sitting on their table when they came home from serving in World War II. Like that? Next one. Not, it's not quite the child of nature, but it's a caricature that, you know, either animals dressed up in regalia, and re regalia is not a costume. Okay, regalia is religious. It has a lot of spiritual meaning. It is very, uh, you don't give it away without a lot of thought. Okay, they are handed down from generation to generation. It is not a costume. A costume is what you put on to be somebody else. Regalia is to put on what is you. Okay, next. You have the Disney version, you know, every Indian can talk to animals and they talk back and everybody understands everybody, okay? <laughs> That's just it. And again, there's the bad ones and the good ones. So, and, and the thing is, is that so many kids today still think Pocahontas had a great life after she got married. Not so much, folks, not so much. Read your history, right? Next one. And then we go into something that's even more, uh, Scott was talking about how history informs what's happening today. This is a huge one. Oh yeah, and we, we hear this a lot. Now, the collegiate sports, what is it, um, whatever the national collegiate sport organization is, said we're not dealing with any derogatory mascots. If you have a derogatory mascot in your school, you cannot participate in our sporting events, which means that every college changed mascots if they had to. High schools, they have not required that. There are nine in the state that still have Indians or Braves with, with an Indian image mascot. There's a ton of elementary schools that still have them, okay? And this is the attitude. Well, this is a way to honor those people. Well, you know, I think you can come up with something different. Next one. 1996 or seven, and I couldn't quite get the, the connection between a, a rabid looking, I'm not quite sure what's happening here and why it's an Indian man. Uh, I didn't get it. But this is a billboard in Kentucky, I think it's in, um, I don't remember where this was. It was in Baltimore. Next one. There's a huge problem with this. There's a, there's a number of problems with this. <laughs> Guys, there is a problem here. <laughs> All right. Number one is she has a headdress on, and it is not a real one. But the problem is, is that headdresses are, have a significant, okay, 
Would you feel differently if she walked out with actual um, military medals on, a military uniform on? An American military uniform, would you feel differently about it? Well, she's not wearing much, but if she had like the hat on. Um, that's, that's an equivalent of your military medals. It is an equivalent of a medal of honor. People don't get these just by being an ordinary person. They are, they are gifted, they are handed down in families. So it's not something you just pick up, it's not like a ball cap. Aside from that fact, Native American women are four times more likely to be sexually assaulted than any other group of women in the U.S. and Canada. Sexualizing Native American women has started from the get-go and has not stopped, ever. It's, it's still the same, it's still the same numbers, unfortunately, uh, and this issue has been covered up for decades. And you still have problems with this kind of uh, presentation of American Indian women. Next one. This one is a 2006, 2006 advertisement. Um, again, you have the sexualization of an American Indian woman. Uh, aside from the fact that she's wearing a costume, um, but that's, that's the option of the women's costumes for American Indian costuming. And that's the other thing. As you walk into any party store or any Halloween store, they always have a section that has American Indian costumes. Do you have costumes for anybody else? Now, if you had a costume for Disney Pocahontas, okay, I'll get that. You have a costume for... Um, Indian in the Cupboard, the character out of that book and then the movie. Okay, I get that. That's an individual character. But when you say Indian woman, Indian princess, of course, uh, it brings it to a whole new ballgame because you don't have those types of uh, costumes for other groups of people. You don't. Next one. And then you have this issue, Redskins issue. The redskin term came into uh, political use when the French, British, and American governments were paying for scalps. They were redskins. So what you're saying is that, you know, you go scalp a couple people and bring the scalps to me and I'll pay you for them. Well, what, what happened was is they started splitting the scalps up into different uh, they cut them smaller, so they said, oh yeah, I got, I got four instead of two or one, so you have to pay me for four. Then they, they went to different body parts so that they couldn't be split up. So they went to ears and thumbs and things like that. Uh, and they were, that was the bounty, that's what they were getting paid bounty for, but that's where the term redskin came from. It didn't come from people painting. Most, most, uh, most indigenous people in North and South America painted. Some of it with ochre, uh, ochre paint, which is red. Uh, that's not where that came from. So when you have a whole, we have the Native American Congress says, this is not good, okay? Native American Congress passed policy to say, this is not good. You have tribes saying, this is not good, and yet you still have somebody saying, oh, but we want to honor you. And you have people that still wear these jerseys. You have, you know, stickers. It's still there. It's, if it was any other group of people, this wouldn't be happening. But that's not what you got. Next one. Because they don't get it. They don't get it. If you don't see that both of these are the same, you don't get it. And, and so when you're talking about Native history in Kentucky, you have this huge this huge stream of time where uh, all kinds of technological advances were happening. And, and so much of what we do uh, as Americans today, as, as people from this continent today, is based on American Indian technological advance, whether it's in uh, weaponry or whether it's in agriculture. It's based on that. And yet for the past 
couple hundred years, we don't get it. We haven't gotten it yet. These are just people. We need to treat them with respect like we treat anybody else. And that's where the commission is trying to work, is trying to, to, to get rid of these stereotypes, trying to educate people so that you start thinking about the terms that you use. You start critically looking at the images that are in your, your, your kids or grandkids or your schools uh, or your library's books. You start, you start critically analyzing that stuff. And you start having a really good discussion about, you know, I learned this, you know, what they say, um, what's the, what's the um, everything that your grandparents taught you isn't so, or I forget, um, it's, it's gone now. But, so we're trying to bring all this together. We're trying to make sure um, the actual factual history is learned. Uh, and that means displacing some stuff that, that we learned, that I learned in school, and that's not so. So that's where we are. That's where we are. Thanks, folks. So, it's your turn. Good question. Well, this is the scary part. <laughs> I think I didn't even look at the clock. I think we have a, cu a couple minutes so we can t uh, take a few questions if there are any questions from the group. Yes, sir. Have you done any studies of the hieroglyphics down at the uh, Red River Gold? There are a ton of them down there. I, I personally have not, but there are, um, there's the Rock Art of Kentucky book that was published in the 19... I want to say 1970s maybe, and Doc Coy was one of the uh, writers of that book. And since then, there's been others that have been uh, found and identified. So Red River Gorge is, is just chock full of. It's of authentic, right? Oh yes, sir, absolutely. Another question. Here about two years ago, one of the local farmers out in the Peaks Mill area was killing up some ground and found some Indian burials. Mm -hmm. Did you all investigate those? Yes. Um, anytime a burial is struck, inadvertently um, by, by you know, local people on their own property, or if it's you know, a pipeline going through it or interchange going through, whatever happens, a bridge, abutment, whatever, uh, you have to call your county coroner to come in and make sure it's not something more recent. Uh, and then typically there's, there's two things that happen. One is that project stops and, and our office is, is tasked with deciding whether we need to move that or whether we, the people need to go around it, okay? Um, that's one of the things with the uh, transportation office is involved with that. So when the, when the state or federal money is being used, uh, we get to say, oh, you gotta go around that. Or if we move those graves, they're, they're taken out and they're put in a, a safe spot that won't be bothered. And that happens uh, more frequently than we would like. We'd much prefer to leave those folks where they were, where they were interred. But there are so many burials across the state and there are huge cemeteries. You all are uh, aware of Slack Farm? Back in the 80s in Union County, if you're not, you need to be aware of this because this had impact nationally. Uh, there was a huge farm down there that was family owned for generations. The, um, the patriarch died and the farm was split up among his uh, kids. And I think uh, some of it was sold off and some of it was saved and uh, through a turnover of hands, part of this area, which they knew to be a prehistoric cemetery, was, was leased to a looter. They went in and um, basically pot hunted, they dug up all the graves, hundreds of graves, looking for the goodies, looking for the um, artifacts that are buried with the dead. And they were gonna uh, take those and sell them. And you can, you can type in on any internet for anything that you're looking for, prehistoric pot, um, you know, pot hunters or relic hunters, and they'll pop up on the internet now. And they, this site looked like something out of um, a bomb, a strafing run in World War II. Uh, there, were, there were hundreds of graves that were turned up. There were skeletal remains that were up on the back dirt piles. But because of that, 
uh, the Native American Graves Protection uh, and Repatriation Act was passed in the U.S. legislature, okay? So we have a national law that says you can't do that. The problem is putting that into practice is difficult because you have to actually catch people in the act. So you, you basically have to catch somebody with a shovel in the ground before you can, um, before you can prosecute them for that. And a lot of judges won't prosecute because they say, oh, it's no big deal. But, well, what it really comes down to is so many people are collectors that they don't want to get into that. But essentially, you're, um, you've dug up somebody's graves to <clears throat> steal their jewelry. That's what you're doing. But yes, uh, typically when things are located, we will, uh, people in our office or the State, Ar uh, State Office of Archaeology will come out and determine kind of what it is and, and there'll be some negotiation on what happens to it. Have mm -hmm. they dated the uh, archaeological stuff at the Bedlam <clears throat> Some of that is quite old, like <coughs> nine, 10,000 years old. Nine, nine or 10,000 years nine, old. 10. It is. Uh, the stuff that's in the rock shelters are really fantastically preserved. That's where we found the uh, sunflower seeds that were charred and some that were not uh, in the rock shelters there. And that's where we found quite a bit of the woven fabric. We found all kinds of um, sandals that have been made from natural fibers, the same type that were found in um, Mammoth Cave. And I tell you what, folks going down into Ma anybody ever been in Mammoth Cave? Okay, you know it's black as the inside of a cat. You know in there, and they have not gone anywhere, anywhere in the Mammoth Cave system that they haven't found evidence of prehistoric peoples being there first, which is impressive when you're thinking they're going down in there with a flame torch, folks. All right. It gives me the willies. <laughs> They're going in with a flame torch. They were doing, um, they were mining gypsum out of Mammoth Cave. But again, as they found all kinds of stuff, in, they found burials in Mammoth Cave. They found remains of, of food, of clothing in Mammoth Cave. They found uh, a guy that was squished with a rock because a rock fell on him and he was there. Um, so again, you know, and that's a different, a different cultural area than Red River Gorge. They're two different, two different kind of groups of folk. So they were doing different stuff at the time. Yes, yes. The uh, agricultural development of Red River Gorge, mm -hmm. is there any of the current day or historical tribes that you could connect that to? Was that a Shawnee? More than, okay. More than likely. Yeah. Here, here's, here's what's happening with that, is uh, when you had that thinning out of the population of Kentucky because of certain epidemics coming through and the warfare between the Shawnee and the Cherokee, you had, you had kind of a no man's land in central Kentucky for a while. Didn't they move to the coast for a while? They did move, yeah. Well, there's more than one group of Shawnee, so they were already kind of spread around. They're, they're up in Pennsylvania and they're down, uh, there's down, they're down south as well now. Um, when that happened, then uh, when you had, okay, I lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, the, the Shawnee continued to claim the majority of Kentucky as their their homeland. And they claim that the mound builders of eastern Kentucky uh, are their ancestors. Now, history and archaeology cannot support that yet. Uh, we, don't, we don't have any direct evidence to support that, but that's what their stories say. Uh, and there's, there's no break in the continuity of their stories from this area. So it depends on, you know, who you want to listen to. Tricia, if you don't mind, I think what we'll do is if we have some further questions, do you mind staying around a little bit and answering questions no for folks? Folks, I think I want, uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming today, and hopefully we'll see you back here at our Food for Thought on December. Thank you all.